Welcome back to the pool table. It's good to have you all back. We've got another podcast for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and then I'll introduce our guest. I'm Jason again, as usual. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm Lou. I'm Ian. I'm Ross. I'm Christy. I'm Catherine. And we have a very special guest tonight, George. George, would you like to give yourself a wee introduction, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, so I'm George Rice. Uh, I'm a lecturer in politics at West College Scotland. Um, I must say, uh, before we go further on the podcast, that I'm here in a personal capacity. Uh, all views uh, and discussion points are my own, not representative of my employer. And now that I've got that uh, out of the way, uh, yep, I've been uh, teaching uh, for five years uh, now. Uh, went and studied uh, business studies and politics at the University of Stirling, uh, and then uh, done uh, a master's degree uh, Dundee University after that and then uh, back to Stirling uh, University so uh, when you go to uh, university um, it's great I had the time of my life um, but you do uh, quickly learn <laughs> that you have to uh, knuckle down uh, and do the work um, so that's just a wee plea to any of my students who might be uh, listening to this if you've got assessments coming up do the work <laughs> <laughs> just use the platform while I've got it yeah, never know when this is. This might be actually going out. So just at any time, you've no, got yeah. stuff coming up. Uh, thanks very much for coming down. I appreciate that. Glad to be here. So young people, as is tradition already, have got some questions all to do with politics, Great. different areas of politics to ask you. And does anyone particularly want to start us off before I just pick one of you? Ewan, what question have you got for George? Well, uh, my first question for you is to George is, what is the difference between the Scottish and the UK government and its power? Okay, uh, it's a very good question. Um, good place to start, because uh, actually a lot of young people don't recognise that we have uh, our own uh, political structures uh, in Scotland. So um, at UK level, we've got a British government and a British parliament. Right? Uh, usually the laws that are passed there apply on a UK-wide basis. Although there are some uh, decisions that we take uh, in Scotland by our uh, own political structures. Uh, and those are decided by the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament. So examples of things that the Scottish uh, Parliament and government is responsible for would be uh, the environment, uh, for example, what your local council does. So providing social care uh, all the way down to emptying bins uh, on a fortnightly basis. Uh, those are decided at uh, Scottish level. Um, the UK is a sort of big political stuff, right? We call it high politics, uh, in inverted commas. And that's things like defence, right? So guns and bombs, who defends the country, right? That's, that's still a matter for the United Kingdom. Uh, other things like the constitution, right? And you'll hear this a lot if you try to tune into politics. You'll hear, particularly in Scotland, politicians talking about the constitution. Now, usually in that context, what they're referring to is Scottish independence, right? Um, so there is a dividing line between the two bodies, um, but that's, that's generally it, that, that we've got the uh, ability to take uh, decisions uh, in Scotland that affect the people of Scotland, and we've had that since 1999. Answer your question, Ken. Thank you. Catherine, I think you've got quite a good question that you'd like to ask, George. What's the difference between left and right-wing politics? Right, left-wing and right-wing politics. Um, OK, uh, these are terms that are uh, bandied about uh, quite often. Um, I'm going to throw some isms at you, right? And this might put you to sleep. Love a good ism. There are uh, things called political ideologies, right? Now, all that means is a set of political ideas, just <coughs> beliefs, right? And none of these beliefs are right or wrong, right? That's why we have political debates and political discussions. Everyone has their own views. Even if you don't realise it, you have political views. Every one of you does. Um, so examples of political ideologies from left to right are communism, socialism, liberalism, conservatism and fascism, right? I don't know, have you heard of one or any of those or none of them? None of them, right? Okay, that's fine. Um, generally, uh, when we try to frame politics and what a politician is saying, because sometimes it's not the clearest, right? Um, we use that uh, to try and understand better uh, why they're saying the things that they're saying. So left-wing politicians generally believe in a big state or a big public sector. What does that mean? It means uh, that they place more emphasis on bodies which are funded through taxation, right? So your publicly funded institutions. So education, NHS, for example, are examples uh, of those. So left-wing politicians very much believe 
uh, and the state running things, right? So publicly owned, paid for by tax. Uh, right wing politicians generally believe in a smaller state, right? So they think rather than paying for these things through taxation, where everyone pays uh, through their pay slip, that they should be run by private businesses. And from their perspective, that's a better way of doing things because if they're pursuing profit, right, they're trying to make money, they'll find better ways of running things. Now, that debate is as old as the hills, right? It's it's always existed in politics and it will always exist in politics. And most things in politics, I say this to my <coughs> students every single year across all levels, is it's all shades of grey, right? Which, uh, if you're new to politics, is quite tricky, right? Because very seldom can you get a black or white answer, but it is, it's, it's all shades of grey. 50 of them. But, Perhaps I 50 of them, or 50 shades darker, perhaps, who knows, right? Oh um, but yeah, it's 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 simply a matter of uh, perspective. Yeah. I don't know, <coughs> does that help? Yeah. Answer your question. Still thinking about the 50 shades of grey thing. Yeah. So leading off of that, Catherine, uh, George kind of, all the isms came out. Do you know what, like, fascism, socialism is? No. Maybe George could, like, know briefly. Very briefly. Some of the kind of differences are between them yeah because i think the isms as well like some of the language in politics is what's so off-putting right and i think a lot of people uh, are keen to get interested in politics and they want to find out more about it but they just can't because they pick up either a textbook or they read uh, one of the the good quality newspapers and they see all these words and it's all jargon and it's very difficult to understand so in a sentence or two i'll explain each uh, of the ideologies so communism is effectively where the state runs the show right so everything is run uh, by the state through uh, ultimately with taxation but there would be no private enterprise right there's there's no private businesses whatsoever socialism um is maybe a little bit less extreme than that if i can put it that way so if um we're looking at a system where the state runs the show well socialism is more about the state running the key industries right so energy transport for example so in a socialist society, just for example, ScotRail would probably be publicly run, right? It would be run by uh, the state. Uh, liberalism is, is all about individual freedom, but it's that ideology where we start to see a move away from uh, such a, a large role for the state. So in a sense, for liberals, the state should be quite minimal, right? The state should provide your security uh, and uphold your freedoms, right? Freedom of speech. <laughs> freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. But apart from that, the state shouldn't do very much, right? Uh, conservatism, um, it's kind of like Ron Seal. That's what it says on the tin, right? You, you've got conservatism, it's to conserve, right? Don't like radical change. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's a couple of things that go along with conservatism as well, and that's a focus on tradition, right? Because uh, tradition gives us some s sort of stability, and conservatives generally believe uh, strongly uh, in uh, preserving the, the, the structures as uh, they exist uh, and then fascism um, is if, if you think of uh, Adolf Hitler or uh, Benito Mussolini uh, in World War II that's that's fascism okay. um, there are a couple of other isms that don't fit on the left to right scale so environmentalism as a political ideology in itself doesn't really fit uh, on that scale uh, neatly uh, and nationalism which comes about uh, quite a bit so um, there is two types of nationalism I think it's important to explain this because this is something that's not really discussed in mainstream political discourse right when you watch tv or read the newspaper and um quite often uh, well obviously we have uh, the scottish national party and government in scotland who describe themselves as a nationalist party so whatever your views on the smp are it's important to know what nationalism uh, is so hard nationalism uh, and soft nationalism although they share the same term they're wildly different from one another right hard nationalism is on ethnic lines. So that's the stuff that we've seen aligned to uh, Adolf Hitler and the German Nazi party, right? That's hard nationalism. Soft nationalism is a world away from that. It's not related in any way, shape or form. And actually soft nationalism, or civic nationalism, nationalism to give it its proper name, is about being inclusive, right? So it means that you've got a nation, so in this case, Scotland, but quite often you won't hear the SNP talk about the Scottish people they talk about the people of Scotland. So if you can see that distinction, it's about well, anyone who lives and works here can be part of the nation, mm -hmm. right? So I just thought that was uh, important. But that's the ideologies and a couple of sentences uh, each.
I know that's a, a lot a... to hit you with to start with. Yeah, it certainly could go more in depth, <laughs> yeah. which we're not going to do today. <laughs> uh, but does that give you a wee bit more information? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know it's difficult. Can... I'm rhyming yeah, all yeah. this stuff off. And the good thing is you can like listen it. to this back and... You know. Actually, try and... <laughs> try and get it. <laughs> and at that point, you'll be like that. Catherine, of past, you know all this now? Exactly. That's you talking to yourself, by the way. Not someone else. There's <laughs> that a lot called Catherine. Um, would you say... Right, this is this is gonna be a hard question to like word. Okay. Would you say that Scotland like what what one would you say Scotland is Into. of the isms? Ah, oh, right, okay. Um so that is a very difficult question because I don't think I I mean in the twenty first century, particularly in, in Europe, I don't see us looking at a country and saying that country is a communist state or a socialist state or a liberal <coughs> state um, what I would say is if I had to pick liberalism right because we all have a focus on individualism and a focus on the freedoms right we didn't just wake up with these freedoms one day we didn't just wake up with freedom of speech freedom of expression freedom of assembly freedom of religion pick your favourite freedom right we didn't just wake up with these these came from thinkers who were described as being liberal so even uh, the Labour Party at the moment uh, has gone back to being uh, a socialist party uh, but they accept the freedom element of liberalism so they don't reject that uh, right off the bat again similar with conservatives they accept the freedoms that go along with liberalism so in a word liberalism I guess uh, if I'm forced to choose but you've got different political parties which believe in different things and they want to get power because they want to make differences uh, to the country but the, although they want to make positive change, they disagree on the way to make that change, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. So it's all a matter of perspective. Your 50 shades agree, right? <laughs> can we stop? <laughs> oh, can we just stop that yeah, whole okay. 50 shades thing? Feel that. We can stop that and go right on to your question, Ross. Okay. Oh, that was smooth. Yeah, segue. <laughs> segue yeah. What is the European Union and what countries are in it? How long have we got, Jason? <laughs> no, you're all right, go on. <laughs> so, um, the European Union, right, let let me start at the very beginning. So, <clears throat> before the European Union, there was a focus on protectionism, right? Protectionism is, sorry, that's another ism. Just an, an idea that um, a country looks after its own affairs before anything else, right? Oh. So, the state first, that country comes first. Um, now, the reason why a lot of countries go to war is sometimes to access each other's resources, right? It's about money or about materials, oh. um, quite often. Oil, right? The Iraq War in 2003 is a, a prime example of that. So Europe had been ravaged by war, and the original idea was, well, okay, if we integrate the economies, right, uh, the products that uh, countries in Europe produce, if we integrate those, there's no reason for them to go to war anymore. And in fact, not only is there no reason for them to go to war, it's going to be costly for them to go to war. So the European Union started life as the European coal and steel community, right? So you took French coal, and German steel, and you integrated them, right? So they didn't. So France and Germany, who were constantly at war, no longer had a reason to go to war. That was the birth of the European Union. Generally, free trade is seen as a good thing because if you've got access to other countries' markets, you've got access to their resources, the things that they produce, then it reduces conflict because, again, you're bringing countries together, right? So that's what the European Union is at a basic level. Now, it's a bit of a political hot potato because there are 28 members of the European Union. And to get 28 people to agree on something, never mind 28 countries, is very difficult. Um, so the European Union is not perfect. It will never be perfect. And I think we've seen that in the European Union referendum campaign from the Vote Leave side. They were able to say, here are the problems uh, with the European Union. But th the whole point of free trade is to ensure that we've got access to each other's products. So if you like Ben & Jerry's, for example, if there are... Uh, uh, ingredients in Ben and Jerry's that come from elsewhere in the European Union, well, that can come in cheaply because there's no there's no barriers to that coming in. Usually, a country would put a tax on products coming in, right? So a tax on imports, and the reason that they would do that is so that people would buy British stuff or Scottish stuff or whatever it is, right? Um, so the concern uh, with uh, leaving the European Union uh, could be that prices of things start to go up. Will we lose products from like some companies? I'm still concerned about Ben & Jerry's. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think Ben & Jerry's is probably a safe one, right? Yes. 
Um, but if it's a no deal Brexit, which means that we, we leave without any sort of arrangement with the European Union, mm -hmm. then it could potentially mean the government's own documents tell us this, the British government's own documents. Uh, neatly called Operation Yellowhammer, by the way. I think that's a fantastic name. <laughs> um, it's Operation Yellowhammer, by the way. Uh, isn't it? Isn't it just? Uh, their, their own um, documents show that the, pre the price of fresh food uh, will go up. But apart from that, uh, you'll probably start to need to get used to items being available on a seasonal basis. right? So mm -hmm. you, you won't be able to get into Morrison's or other supermarkets are available, by the way, right? <laughs> but you won't be able to go into Morrison's and maybe get strawberries in January. right? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And that doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you consider that the way businesses operate and the way that they produce their goods, it's so integrated with the European Union that it's very difficult to tear ourselves away from that. And that's what the problem's going to be. We've been members since the 1970s. It didn't happen overnight. And likewise, whatever happens with the European Union, there's not going to be an overnight solution. So I think kind of backtracking that, talking about leaving the European Union, kind of ties nicely into Lewis, what you've got as your question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what is Brexit and how will it affect you? Right, so I'll take the easiest one first. I was going to say easy one, but neither of those questions are <laughs> uh, particularly easy uh, questions. Um, so Brexit at a general level just means leaving the European Union. Right, that's what it means. <coughs> British exit. Brexit. Um, well, now, th th there's a couple... Of, what was that, son? Well done for the government. Amazing name, eh? Ah, well, yes. <laughs> but there's, a different, uh, there's different ways that that can take place so like I said you can leave with no deal which is where there's, there's no agreements put in place with the rest of the European Union um, but you could also leave with agreements on some things right and I'm, I'm not going to turn it into a lecture on uh, the economy and all the strands of the British economy and stuff like that but um, the idea is that if we can get an agreement to leave where we don't have those sorts of barriers on goods coming in or goods going out by the way um, then that will be smoother for everyone it'll be smoother for the <laughs> remaining 27 countries of the European Union will be smoother for the UK and that would seem to be the best way to go but there are a few problems uh, with that. Why, and just to kind of further go into Brexit because I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to ask stuff about it in general, why, uh, for people that might not know, was the need in the first place to leave the EU kind of met or like why was, it a, why was it brought up in the first place and why was this campaign, you know, for, for on both sides, you know. Sure. So, to go back to the actual calling uh, of the referendum, it was called by the then Conservative Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron. Um, and, and I'm not going to take too long to talk about party politics, but there was one political party which was constantly opposed to the UK being a member of the European Union, and that was UKIP, right? Which stands for the United Kingdom Independence Party. As they saw it, we weren't independent uh, from, the, uh, from the European Union. So UKIP had started to do quite well in uh, places where the Conservatives usually won elections, right? But then they also started to do quite well in areas that uh, were traditionally Labour voters, right? So that left-right spectrum I was telling you about, voters across that spectrum started to vote for UKIP. Um, the Conservative Party as well is, is, is famously always tears itself apart over the question of Europe. Some are very pro-European, some are very anti-European. Um, so for David Cameron, the idea was, well, if we have the vote, we'll just get this over with and that's it dealt with. So people in his party will link arms and sing Kumbaya once again, right? Because they've all had their say on it. And it kills off the UKIP threat because the people got a vote on uh, EU membership. Uh, so there's no need for that party anymore. So that was the idea. And he thought, people will vote to remain because why wouldn't they? How wrong he was. Yeah, how wrong right? we all probably so, better think. Exactly. Better thinking. Yep. Yeah. So it, so it didn't go his way. The, the Leave campaign won by 52% uh, to 48%. Uh, that's that's kind of why the referendum came around. Uh, in the first place, there, there was no uh, massive clamour, I don't think, uh, for a, a referendum on European Union membership. And there's, there's kind of a problem with referendums, and that is that so that's, so that's a vote on a specific issue, by the way. So the European Union re uh, referendum was a vote. Do you want to remain or do you want to leave? Forget the rainbow of issues that go along with both those camps. Mm -hmm. it's, it's leave or remain. So by default, you're splitting the country into two halves. Yep. You're saying you are remainers and you are leavers. And, and that's it. And today, people have very strong views on the European Union. But pre prior to the referendum, I don't think 
uh, those strong views really existed uh, yeah. in society. So it galvanised people for better or for worse. Uh, and we've came to a position where people are getting really hot under the collar, actually, about what's happening. Which is sort of similar situation to, I guess, the Scottish independ- uh, yeah. referendum as well, you know, same scenario. Of, um, what yeah. were you? I think you were about to ask something there, Catherine. Um, why would people, like, want to leave? Like, what, what will it do for our country? So, I'll take you back to the 2016 uh, European Union the, uh, referendum campaign and what the, what the uh, Vote Leave campaign uh, said was a couple of things. So, for one, it's a matter of democracy for the Leave campaign because there is often a question of, so what does the European Union do? Right? And what is the European Union? That, that was your question. But sometimes what the European Union actually does and how it actually operates is kind of different from what it was set up to do. Right? So, uh, in a sense, the European Union... Um, has to pass laws that every member state has to comply with. So you're 28 members, because again, it's difficult to get 28 people to agree to something, never mind 28 countries. So environmental standards, for example, the European Union wants to make sure that because we're in a climate emergency, that we're reducing carbon emissions. So they they um, will pass laws that every EU member must comply with. Now, that, that's just one example uh, of one of the, I think we would agree, good things that the European Union does. Um, but for the Leave campaign, what they said was, but Europe has far too much control over our processes then. That means that uh, unelected bureaucrats at, in, in the European Union can tell us what to do, and our elected politicians, the people that we vote for, don't get a say over that. So that was a big one for them. They phrased it as taking back control. Let's take back control from the European Union. Um, Another element of that campaign, though, uh, was uh, immigration. And the Vote Leave campaign actually, in many ways, relegated the referendum campaign to a referendum on immigration, which it wasn't designed to be uh, in the first place. And part of the reason for that is, uh, whether you realise this or not, by being members of the European Union, uh, you can go elsewhere uh, in the EU to, to uh, eventually work or study uh, or live. Right? That, that's a right that you have uh, as an EU member. Now, that's good. Um, and obviously it improves our freedom in terms of pursuing whatever we want to pursue. But I suppose a problem with that is that national governments can't control immigration from within the EU, right? So in a sense, there's an open border. So the Leave campaign highlighted uh, some problems with that. Uh, And the reason that that resonated with so many people is if you look at immigration as an issue, right, um, it's, it's broadly beneficial to society. Uh, culturally, because it enhances our culture, right? We get new cuisine, we get new ways of doing things, uh, we're introduced to uh, new uh, forms of music, all that sort of stuff. But there's any, an economic benefit as well. We make money from immigrants and that's not something that is really highlighted a lot uh, in the mainstream <coughs> press, right? Because it's, it's an issue that people get so hit up about, but actually the British public is really not informed about it. So, um, instead of politicians, in successive years, making that positive case for immigration. Here's the good things about immigration. This is why it's a good thing. They kicked the can down the road and they said, well, yeah, okay, but we can't do anything about immigration because we're members of the European Union. Sorry, chaps, that's just by virtue of membership. That's just the way it goes. So then guess what happens when 40 years later people are asked to vote on it? They they remember this. They say, yes, well, it was the European Union that stopped us uh, having a say on our own uh, immigration policy. Uh, and it came back to bite them. It came back to bite them in the worst way. And I know democracy is a popularity contest, right? You need to get people on side, you need to get people to vote for you so you get power. Uh, and if immigration is, is a tough argument, then I can understand to an extent why politicians ran from it. But in the end, they really done us all a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. And we instead of making that positive case. We were just talking about that back here, as we audience back here. Yeah, so we've got a, an audience participation today for our third <laughs> podcast. Wave, wave everyone. Or no one. Yay. That's unenthusiastic. Yeah, enthusiastic. Yeah, we, we had a wee show of hands, but it might be quite cool again just to discuss it during the podcast. Um, asked some of the guys uh, to put their hands up if they uh, wanted to travel Europe or work abroad in the future. Can we get another wee show of hands of anybody that would want to travel Europe? Put your yeah, hand these right guys too. Yeah, I mean, really is it unanimous? Be, you bring that a wee bit closer to your mouth, Ali. Lewis doesn't. You don't. You don't. You don't want to travel. Does anyone get any questions about how travel, how that would, 
how politics or Brexit would affect that. Anyone? Did anyone write that down? Christy? Um, what about how Brexit would affect like going abroad for uni and schooling? I throw my hands up um, because uh, until we have some sort of uh, agreement with the European Union going You're forward, know, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure when this uh, podcast will go out, but um, the, the current plan is for the UK to leave without a deal uh, on the 31st of October. If that happens, and I stress if, then I see it as being quite unlikely that you will have easy access to work and study or live uh, elsewhere in the European Union. Because ultimately, it goes back to what I said about the Vote Leave campaign. If they want to bring in stronger controls on immigration, other countries are going to do that in retaliation, aren't they? So, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't really give uh, an answer uh, on that. If we remain members of the European Union, if Brexit gets cancelled, then the rights that we currently have will be enjoyed and they'll carry on. If we leave with an agreement, um, again, that could take many forms, but the, the most recent draft of the agreement that has been discussed Yes, it would still allow you to go and live and work elsewhere in the EU to an extent, but at the moment, I can't answer. And if you're listening to this, you know the answer. Yeah, possibly, aye. <laughs> as, well. uh, as well, so we'll soon see yeah. what the thing was. Leave a comment. <laughs> Leave a comment, yeah. Let's, let us know what happened. Like, we don't know. <laughs> We're stuck in this podcast. Uh, what other question have we got? We got I, yeah, Olivia, um, go for it. With talking about immigration again, what, like, well, no how, but... How will it change for people to immigrate to our country, and will it make I not make it difficult? But in what ways will it make it difficult? So uh, again, this very much depends on what happens uh, post Brexit. If Brexit ever happens, but um, what the Conservative government at the moment uh, wants to put in place is is a point system, uh, similar to what Australia has, right? Mm -hmm. So there's very strict controls on immigration in Australia, where you can only really get in if you have a job. To go to usually a, a decent and well paying job uh, or you're highly skilled and it's skills that the Australian uh, people are, are looking for but I suppose the, the concern that I would have with that is is there then not a class issue right so if you're yeah. poorer and maybe you don't have those skills or that or a higher level of education or money to support yourself until you get a job then you're effectively writing poorer people out of the process and, and I suppose I've just got a question as to whether, whether or not that's right um, in fact, I'd like to hear your views on that, um, if you have any. I feel like some people, not just in general, like the people who immigrate to our country a lot, who, how you're saying about the class kind of system, but the yeah. people who are, you know, are poorer, not not all of them, but, a, but a, not a few, but, you know, like some mm -hmm. come and they use our benefits and they take advantage of them and they don't, they don't, don't contribute. Help, yeah, don't contribute and they don't help anything like making our country because we're trying to make it better by letting them in but then it's not, it's just not getting any better. Yeah, uh, and that, I mean, that is something that is A, in the media uh, quite a bit and B, was something, again, that the Leave campaign focused on uh, during the European Union referendum but uh, the, the reality of that, th that does happen, right? I'm not denying for a second that people come and claim benefits that they shouldn't be claiming or it's health tourism they come to use the NHS because it's free like fine I, I don't dispute that that happens but if you look at um, a study I don't, I don't have the figures in front of me but it was a University College of London study so academics well researched properly researched uh, they looked at the period from 2004 to 2014 uh, and found that there was a net benefit right so th there was an overall benefit of migration from elsewhere in the EU coming into the UK of somewhere around £30 billion, pounds, right? So that's net, so that's after the costs of paying benefits and stuff like that uh, to EU migrants. So, I mean, that's that's a Herculean amount of money. And, th and there are uh, places in the UK where there are pressures on hospitals and on schools. But th the point I would make to that then, and I'm not being party political about this, the, the point I would make about that is that the money has been taken in from immigration, but it's not been spent, yeah, it's not been reinvested. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what's it been spent on? Yep. Um, and, uh, well, migration is obviously a matter for the UK government, not the Scottish government. So uh, Labour and Conservatives have blood on their hands from that point of view. Christy? Um, question for you, I'll move on to that. Hypothetically, coming back to independence, 
Would an independent Scotland stay in the European Union? Again, it's it's shades of grey. So the Scottish National Party's position is, yes, that an independent Scotland would be uh, members of the European Union. It's the Scottish Green Party's uh, position as well, by the way. Um, the problem comes because every European Union member has a veto over new members. So if one member doesn't like a proposed new member, they can chuck it out. Right? Now, that might be a problem for an independent Scotland because there are independence movements elsewhere in Europe. So uh, in Spain, you've got independence movements in uh, the Basque Country mm-hmm. and in Catalonia. Yeah. Uh, also to a lesser extent in, uh, extent in Galicia, although Galicia kind of wants to rejoin Portugal, which I find quite fascinating in its own right. Um, but apart from Spain, because that's, the, that's the, the often cited example, yeah. right? Um, in Belgium as well, uh, Belgium is fragmented along linguistic lines and you find that those in the north who tend to speak Dutch feel quite different from those in the south who tend to speak uh, French. Uh, in the Dutch-speaking part, Flanders, uh, there are two major um, independence, pro-independence parties there. So, to wind to the end of the tape, the, the point is that Spain and Belgium might be reluctant. Might see it as a almost threat or a bigger cause for that. To their own country. Yeah. Exactly. Now, I, I, I know that the Spanish foreign uh, minister had said, no, we would accept an independent Scotland, but the spectre of Brexit haunts us at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. Brexit is everywhere and Brexit colours everything at the moment. So I reckon that the reason that the Spanish Foreign Minister has said that is because he wants to put pressure on the UK to ultimately either remain in the EU or to uh, leave with a deal rather than crashing out. So I think that's... We maybe, tactical. Aye, tactical. Yep. Um, but that that's obviously a concern for an independent Scotland um, because that, there's no doubt that the pro-independence parties would like to be European Union members. Uh, so as we kind of wind to the end, obviously we've got a large group of young people here. I don't know if there's any questions at all from the audience. Have we got anyone that would like to ask anything? Some of you guys wrote down some questions. What what did we have? What did we Just have? Just even a few quick ones before anyone? we before we wrap up. You need to the microphone. Yep, right mm-hmm. into it. Um, what's your thoughts on knife crime in the UK and your view on how it's been challenged? So I think specific. Yeah, that's very specific, but um, but it's a good question because it's topical uh, at the moment. Um, I mean, uh, there seems to be all the time in the press uh, the 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 latest stabbing, right? And and it happens far too frequently, uh, actually. Um, I suppose I would like to hear from you folks, um, because it's younger people who are disproportionately affected by knife crime, and uh, obviously you're closer to your peers than I am, so I'm starting to get to a generation where I'm out of touch, right? Uh, I suppose. There's a few things for me, and um, the first one would be to look at not just the actual crime being committed, but what's the cause of that crime? I mean, is it primarily carried out by people from impoverished backgrounds? Is there a geographical trend there? What I would want to do is try and find some sort of trend uh, and try and understand why that's happening. Because too often we're quick to say, that person stabbed that person, let's lock them up and put them in jail. Okay, that deals with that person, but it doesn't deal with the problem. Yep. It seems to be getting worse and worse. But like I said, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on that, if mm. you have any. Ewan, go for it, man. Um, well, sometimes I think, see when people start talking about like like stabbings in Scotland and yeah. that, sometimes it comes down to like the educational side. Mm-hmm. Like they're not really like education, like well-educated. So see when it comes to like stabbings and that, they're not really, you know, up to, you know... Like they're not really up to date mm-hmm. with like you know the things that are happening. Like, so, do you think it would work if people were to come into schools, whether it was police officers or academics or community workers? Like, do you think that would work? Because I'm or trying to get a feel for you. That, even people that are experienced, you know, in either end of knife yeah, crime, could be someone true. that's even you know done jail time that's came out and rehabilitated mm-hmm. about it and has a different view, and you know can talk about things. What do you think, Ross? Um, like George was saying, I think we should investigate more into why it happened yeah, and the causes. What, what series of events yeah. leads up to someone and try and find doing some, doing some sort like of trend that. in like a specific area mm-hmm. and try and stop it there and see if it stops it in other places. You said about mm-hmm. poverty. This isn't really like my opinion, this is more of a question. But sure. you, you said about poverty. 
why would places that are, let's say, more poor, why would stabbings be more frequent in places that are poor instead of places that are rich? Like, what's the difference there? If anything, you'd think that rich places would be more stabbing because they have the more money. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything inherent about poor people who just happen to go out and stab. Like, I don't, I don't accept that. As, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing. No, no, but but that's something that some politicians would have you believe. They don't say that outright, right? But by saying, "Oh, let's increase the, the jail sentences," that's effectively what they're saying, right? Um, and I come from a working class uh, background uh, as well, so I, I mean, I've I've seen uh, some of this uh, stuff. A, a boy in my year I went to school with uh, was stabbed. In fact, he was uh, brutally attacked. Uh, generally, and I just remember thinking at that time, and that was before I was interested in politics or anything like that, um, the, the people who were talking about dealing with that, it, it wasn't speaking to me uh, as a young person. Now, to go back to your, your question specifically uh, about poverty, I think a lot of it is alienation. Right? The, the people who are impoverished feel like they've been cast aside by society, like mm-hmm. they don't have a role to play. Uh, and then... Ultimately, that can uh, result in particularly younger people falling in with gangs because there's a sense of belonging, there's a sense of purpose there. Uh, so I think that has to be uh, challenged and weeded out where it can be. But then obviously it, it can lead to forms of um, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. And then if someone gets a habit and they're already poor and they need to fund that habit, I mean, they're going to uh, look to uh, carry out crimes to sustain that in many ways as well. I mean, this is all broad brush stuff, and it's it's certainly it could be a full podcast itself. Yeah, it could about be. This, do you know what I mean? It could be for sure. But I think I think there's a there's a cocktail of reasons as to why it affects certain groups, and I think obviously it's not for today. But I think that's something that has to be explored. We have to look at that and say, right, okay, why are people picking up a knife in the first place? Why are they using it against another human being? And how can we stop that from happening? How can we deter that? I think that's a million pound question. Um, I've got something I'd to add to this. One thing I think, um, the because of the kind of I don't want to sound bad here, but mm-hmm. lower ca- like lower class and more poverty people, like um, do it is because they're not. I don't think they're really up to date with the media of you know politics. Like they might be like they're I don't know like they're fighting about something, but they don't know. They don't really know what they're fighting about. But can maybe maybe go back to what George said about them feeling cast aside by society and. Yeah not feeling part of what's happening and feeling valued. So it might lead into that. Uh, talking about young people's opinions, and as a lecturer yourself, yep. do you feel in recent years, uh, obviously, Scottish referendum sparked, it made a lot of people a lot more politically aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel like there has been a rise in young people who are more interested in politics because of recent events? Definitely. And in fact, there's a lot of young people who want to get interested in politics, but they just don't know where to start. Yep, and, and every single year, whatever level it is, so I teach from uh, National 5 level to HNC level, right? So that's across a, a few levels. And uh, constantly, um, students are sometimes put off or sometimes they find it inaccessible because of the jargon, because of the language that is used by politicians uh, or even in the media uh, as well. And I think we need to break down barriers that way. Uh, hopefully, in my classes, that's something that I try to do. I try to break down the jargon and make it understandable and make it relevant mm-hmm. because so many, particularly young people, think, how does politics affect me? And whether you realise it or not, everything is political, right? You want to go with your pals uh, tonight? Come here, uh, congregate uh, as a group. That's a political issue. It's not every country in the world that you're allowed to do that, right? Um, if you want to go and vote, okay, in Scotland you can vote when you're 16. Not everywhere you can vote uh, when you're 16. Um, so, so there's things like that where I think we could all do a better job. Politicians and, and those who teach politics can make it more relevant and make young people understand that this does affect you. It's not something that's been discussed up here. Just because you turn on the TV and you see uh, usually a middle-class white male wearing a suit using fancy language, uh, that's not what politics is, that's an element of politics um, but I think we need to democratise politics by making it understandable and actually I would like to see that happen in schools more, to make it understandable, make it relevant and break down the jargon Perfect, has anyone got any other kind of final questions before we wrap up our third podcast? Anyone in the audience? No one? Anyone here, Ross? I kind of have one that's been on my mind for a while. Go for it. Go for it. So you said in the election it was like 52 to 48%. For the EU referendum? Yeah. Yeah. What would happen if it was like a 50 
Like, would they have another election? Oh, uh, or very interesting. Well, obviously, given given the numbers of people, <coughs> right? Uh, it's that would very, be, very, that very, would be very unlikely if that actually right? happened. So, but I can tell you what happens in an election. So I imagine it's the same. Um, there will be a recount on the night. So the people who count the ballot papers are just regular people, by the way. They tend to work for the council and they get paid to sit deep into the night counting the, the ballot papers. So they'll do that again. They'll do the whole process again. No joy for them. If it's split again, I imagine they would do it probably for a third time, especially if a candidate is particularly unhappy and says, no, I want a recount here. If it is absolutely, definitely 50-50 split, what do you think they do? Do it again. Nope. Do you think they change their add on, not add on to their views, but add more? Ideology. They just throw it out the window. They don't throw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> but forget about it. Add we'll do it again more, some other time. But they, 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 does anyone in the audience know what happens? It's a 50 year. 50 spot. Yeah. They fight. <laughs> that <laughs> might be better, actually. They literally, <laughs> literally draw straws. No, they don't. Yep. Is this an old, old rule then? An old law. Wait, so they like literally. Well, yep, and yep. So like, sure. sure. Mm-hmm. And that's your next thing. I, I mean, I've just learned something tonight. That is. <laughs> just so we ground so ourselves, the the possibility of this happening is <laughs> super slim. <laughs> so it's not like Ali, this is going to happen overnight. Okay, but it could. Draw the straws. I will love it if there's a comment that tells us what's happened in Brexit. <laughs> yeah, and also, by the way, there was happens. an election where it was 50-50. Um, but that is how I'm going to uh, deal with every scenario I've got. I'm just going to draw straws with people now. And <laughs> Sounds good, man. I mean, if up. that's what the politicians can do... <laughs> yeah. then we This can will be one of, one of these eight really old laws, I guess, that's you know not something that's... Aye, it's... Uh, it's yeah. not going to happen, is it? No. But it could. Touch, well. uh, highly unlikely. Yeah. Can you ask, on on ask it into the mic so the podcast picks it up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a question on behalf of these guys because they're, they're awful quiet. They're kind of looking scared at the back here. Um, uh, how can young people get involved in politics? And also, why, with, a, with the digital age that we're in, why can't we have more participation through a digital platform, i.e. like voting on your phone or voting on uh, uh, concepts and ideas and new legislation on your phone? Why, why, why are we still putting ticky boxes and bits of paper. So, question kind of being, I don't know how well it picks up in the microphone, it actually seems quite quiet. Um, that why is there not more digital participation when it comes to voting in the voting system? And why is it still done with pen and paper, uh, pencil and paper? It's, uh, to be honest, it's a good question. Um, I have to say, I think there's something romantic about walking into a polling station and getting your e-sheet of paper and putting a cross on it. And putting putting it in a cross on it as hard it, as it you feels, physically <laughs> can. It feels it more real, paper. right? Because I'm going to be boring for a second, right? But I think... Um, the screens are turning us into a society of spectators uh, as it is we're, we're constantly on our phones we're constantly watching Netflix we're constantly uh, on iPads, tablets all that sort of thing but you're, but you're absolutely right because ultimately we want to make democracy accessible and there's no better way of making that accessible than making it uh, available at your fingertips I, I suppose a concern that I might have is that if, if there's somebody that can't be bothered to get out their bed to go down to a polling booth to make a political decision then I sort of worry a little bit about who they might vote for. Um, but I think there's a lot of merit at looking at e-democracy and, and certainly uh, exploring. Um, like I, I would like to carry out market research. I'd like to talk to young people and see if that would encourage you to vote uh, or, or find out more uh, about the political issues. But I like, I like the question that came before that as well about how young people can get involved. So what I would say is look at what the political parties are saying and see if any of them really excite you, regardless of what you believe. Um, if any of the political parties do excite you, you can uh, look to become an activist on their behalf, right? And that can be just going around chatting doors and talking to people and seeing the issues that affect them uh, and, and feeding that back uh, to the party. I mean, there's, there's loads of stuff that you can do with political parties. Um, if you're not interested in political parties, uh, you could be interested in a specific issue. And then pressure groups come in, right? So if you uh, are, are really concerned about the environment, uh, for example, and you don't want to go down the party political route, you can look at Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth Scotland or WWF and uh, get involved that way. So politics is actually a lot more accessible than you think it is. Mm-hmm. Again, for me, it's just about breaking down that barrier of the chap, and it is usually a chap, that you see on TV speaking a particular way. That's not what politics is all about. That's one part of it. But really, politics is about um, the changes that you want to make in society and what the benefit of those changes would be.
Brilliant. Thanks very much, George, for coming down and speaking to us. My pleasure. Thanks to all the young people here participating yeah, for your yeah. questions. Uh, Some thanks. great questions. I yeah, think. brilliant questions. I hope yeah. you have learned a wee bit more. I certainly have. And we're going to be drawing straws now <laughs> for every, every decision. What's that? And thanks very much for listening to the podcast. Everyone wave to the camera. Yay! <laughs>